Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the second event in the Sacred Music Series offered by the Harvard Catholic Board. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, Program Director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you, both those with us here in person at St. Paul's in Harvard Square, and our virtual audience joining us through YouTube. This afternoon, the forum continues an exciting collaboration between St. Paul's Choir School and the Catholic community in Harvard Square. In today's event, we foreground the Liturgy of the Hours, the most important tradition of prayer in the Church outside the Eucharist, and especially the service of evening prayer for Vespers. For the next 50 minutes, we offer a lecture and discussion about the history, structure, and use of the hours, and Vespers especially, in the Church's worship. Our presenters will also explain how music from another time and place can be integrated into a contemporary service of evening prayer. Then at 3.30, we will pray Vespers together with music sung by the St. Paul's Choir of Men and Boys. The musical selections are from Northern Italy in the 16th and 17th century, and suggest a Vespers service in the church of San Zeno Maggiore in Verona, a church which served as an important model for the architecture of our own St. Paul's, which approaches its 100th anniversary of opening next year. See the first two pages of your worship aid uh, for pictures of the interior and exterior of San Zeno. Allow me to say a brief word about the Harvard Catholic Forum. Our mission is to share the riches of Catholic thought and culture with the academic, professional, and artistic worlds that converge and into and move out from Harvard Square. In addition to our lectures, we offer non-credit courses, master classes, and a recently announced summer seminar. Our programming continues to grow. Pick up a handy printed brochure on your way out about our, about our upcoming events. And by all means, check out our website at harvardcatholicforum.org, where you can sign up for our newsletters, register for future events, and support our important mission by making a financial contribution. All of our programs are given free of charge, but they are not free to put on. So please, help us continue our work. The St. Paul's Choir School, located here at St. Paul's in Harvard Square, was founded in 1963 by Dr. Theodore Mario, and is the only Catholic boys choir school in the United States. They sing during term time at daily and Sunday masses and at weekly sung vespers. Please take a look at the back page of your worship aid for a schedule of weekly choral vespers on Thursdays at 5.30, as well as a Lenten musical devotion with Pergolesi's Stabat Mater. The choir has toured and performed throughout North America and Europe and made numerous recordings. Check out the school's website at stpaulchoirschool.us. Also, right after today's Vespers, any parents interested in admissions are cordially invited to a reception in Di Giovanni Hall right across the bridge in the St. Paul campus. And let me quickly note that the St. Paul's community prays Vespers year-round Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. in the Parish Center Chapel. Please note tonight's event will be archived at the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share the link with friends, colleagues, parishes, chaplaincies, and musical enthusiasts who may be interested. Our post-event YouTube participation always exceeds the numbers we are able to reach on day one. The lecture segment this afternoon will last 30 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. 
Those of you who are here in person should have received a note card and pencil when you came in. If you have a question, please write it on the card. At about 3 o'clock, someone will come up the aisles and collect the cards and bring them up to me. I will pass on as many of the questions as I can. Unfortunately, we are not set up technically to take questions for our virtual audience at the same time. From 3.20 to 3.30 p.m., we will have a break while the choir assembles and the ministers prepare for the service. Please feel free to get up and stretch your legs. There are restrooms directly across the bridge. This afternoon, two speakers will share the podium. The first is Thomas Forrest Kelly, the Morton P. Knappel Research Professor of Music at Harvard, where he has been named a Harvard College Professor in recognition of his teaching and served as chair of the music department. An internationally recognized authority on medieval and early modern music and on the performance of music in historical settings, he has lectured widely throughout the United States and Europe. If I were to list only the most important of his publications and awards, we would have no time to hear him speak, so I stop here. Our second speaker is James Kennerly, Director of Music at the St. Paul's Choir School and at St. Paul's Harvard Square. Rooted in the English choir school tradition, he is an internationally known organist, vocalist, and director. Educated at Cambridge, Mr. Kennerly was organ scholar at Jesus College and later at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He has frequently given solo organ concerts throughout the U.S. and Europe. Mr. Kennerly will be leading the choir of men and boys in the Vespers, aided by Max Adock, the Assistant Director of Music. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kelly. Thank you very much, Stephen Tim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great pleasure. I look forward very much to participating in Solemn Second Vespers of the First Sunday of Lent, a long, complicated title. Maybe uh, we can talk for a minute. I believe that there are people in here who are far more experienced and expert and, than I in the Christian liturgy. But there may be people who are not, and maybe by the time I finish we can all be at a moderate level of uh, anticipation of what we're about to participate in this afternoon. The word liturgy is a Greek word that means sort of public duty, public office. And uh, the word office means essentially the same thing in Latin, officium. It means uh, the function that you perform or that it's your duty to perform. We have officers, we have officials, we have people who officiate. And it has been the practice of Christian communities from the beginning of Christian times to gather together, sometimes to live together, but to gather together to pray. And often in imitation of that verse in the Psalms that says, seven times in the day will I pray to you, and that other verse that says, in the night you are my song. It became the tradition in communities and wherever it could be done to pray seven times in the day and once in the night. That is a lot of uh, office. Those are the office hours. It's part of the much grander, complex, ambitious scheme of using the liturgy to sanctify time, to make all of our time holy so that we have some events. Uh, it's a series of uh, clockwork, circles within circles. The biggest circle might be a lifetime thing. There are certain events, liturgical events, that we participate in only once in our life. Baptism, confirmation, marriage, burial, things of that kind. There are also the great annual cycle. We, we, go through a whole circle every year. We have what we call the proper of the time based on uh, solar date, the date of Christmas, 
and a lunar date, the, the date of Easter, marking Christ's time on earth, his ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the beginnings of the church, all in the course of a whole year. And then there's a whole other yearly cycle, which we call the proper of the saints. And in the front of my book, it has the Roman martyrology for today. So not only is today the second Sunday in Lent, but it is, among other things, the feast of the holy martyrs Perpetua and Felicitas, very important martyrs who are actually named in the Roman canon in the ancient prayer of consecration of the Mass. Um, and in other places, other saints are venerated. So we have those two things going on. We have monthly cycles where we begin a new book of the Bible at the, the evening readings at the beginning of a month. We, have, we observe the seasons in what's called the four times of the year, the quatuor tempora, which got sort of shortened to quatember, and then it got shortened to the ember days. We have... Um, weekly cycles, of course. We have the little Easter, then we have the Sabbath of Sunday that resets our clock every week. And in the course of that week, if we are members of a re religious community, or if we have a book of hours or a breviary and want to participate in the liturgy of the hours, we say the whole book of Psalms every week. At least if we follow the rule of St. Benedict or one of the many other rules set up to organize people to do this. And we, of course, have something that marks the times of day. We have the office hours, the eight times, seven times in the day and one in the night. There are four major services, hours we might call them, because they happen at certain hours, and they are marked by events in the day. We begin the day, just as, uh, as, the, as the Jewish day does, at sunset. And so, we begin our day with, with evening prayers called Vespers, as it comes from the Latin word for sunset or evening. Um, major feasts and Sundays are so important that not only do they have the Vespers that began Sunday yesterday afternoon, but they also trump the following day as Vespers, and so Sundays and major feasts will have two Vespers. First Vespers, we missed it, and second Vespers, we are about to participate. There's also, uh, there's also the service um, of, uh, uh, of getting up in the night uh, to keep awake because you, you don't know when the Lord might come. There's the, uh, the service of vigils, also confusingly known as matins, that's what Frere Jaca was uh, supposed to do, was supposed to stop sleeping, get up and ring the bell for matins. And you get up and, and lots of readings and it goes on for a long time. Then there's sunrise service, known as morning praise, matutina laus, or we just call it lauds. First thing, first thing in the morning when the sun comes up and uh, then there is uh, Vespers, and then again, just before we go to bed, to complete the day, we, we sing Completorium. The day is complete. Uh, it's shortened in English to Compline. So we have those four, uh, Vespers, Compline, Matins, um, and Lauds. And then to mark the daylight hours, we have four what are called little offices, little short offices, that are named for the hours of the day. Prime, terse, sex, known. So if you add all those up, it comes out to eight, seven in the day and also at night. Each of those office hours consists of essentially the same ingredients. A hymn, the recitation of a number of psalms, arranged in such a way if you, if you pray the Roman office or the Benedictine office that you go through the whole Psalter, at least in the traditional arrangement, uh, every week. The recitation of a number of psalms, uh, uh, reading from scripture, a musical response to that reading, some prayers, and a dismissal. That's it. That happens in every office. Four of the offices, the four major offices, also have a canticle. Now, a canticle is just a text from scripture that is sung like a song 
but it isn't a song. So we call it a canticle. And uh, you may well know that the, the, four, the canticles that are sung for the four major offices, there's the Te Deum at Vespers, there's uh, at, at Compline, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace, the Nunc Dimittis, at Lauds, uh, the song of Zechariah, uh, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, and at Vespers, we will hear today, and at every Vespers, the song of Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord. So that's how the office works, except that it's even more complicated and wonderful than that in a way. Because as we go through the psalms in the office, we will start today with the first psalm of Sunday Vespers, which you always do on Sunday. Dixi to Dominus Domino Meo. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And you'd think after 40 or 50 years in the monastery of singing Dixi Dominus every Sunday evening, you'd think, well, you'd, it would get stale. And what prevents it from getting stale is probably your own devotion for, uh, in the first instance, but also the fact that in addition to this weekly cycle, there's an annual cycle. So before and after every song and every canticle, you sing an antiphon, which is a little short musical piece with a text that helps us interpret the psalm we're about to sing for today. And though that series of antiphons goes round in an annual cycle rather than a weekly cycle. So you get a different antiphon with Dixit Dominus just about every time you sing it. So, for example, when we sang Dixit Dominus on Christmas Eve, it's the first, it's the, uh, on Christmas, the first Vespers of Christmas, we sang the antiphon that says, Rex Pacificus, the peacemaker king has been made great the whole world has desired his face. It says, ah, the peacemaker king, that's, it's not just the baby Jesus in the manger, it's the great king we've been waiting for. We sing that, and then when we sing the psalm, Dixit Domin, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right, aha, that's the father speaking to the son who is coming to redeem the world. And it provides us with a moment, a way of meditating on that song. Today, when we sing Dixit Dominus, the antiphon is one that, that, that you recognize as um, uh, you, shall, you should love the Lord your God and serve him only. Those are the words that Jesus cited to the devil when he was being tempted in the wilderness. And the devil shows him various things, and he says, don't, uh, you should, anyway. So we are, what, what we are doing now is quoting, as Jesus did, the words we need to remember in order, uh, in order to serve the right king. Then when we sing, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, we will know that all the kingdoms of the world are of no value to me unless I, unless, unless the great king and his son and, and the enemies, his footstool, that'll be Satan. So we're singing the same song, but we're, I think, meditating, meditating on it differently as these things go round and round. The various pieces come together like a kaleidoscope in beautiful combinations that provide us with ever new and at the same time ever familiar texts to put together and meditate. It makes the regular performance of the office hours, of the office, of our official duty, um, a pleasure and something that is at once familiar and also always new. Now, it's customary. Uh, Vespers is the, is the one office hour that over time has become a kind of a public event, probably because it's at a convenient time. Monastic communities, cathedral, uh, cathedral and collegiate churches go through the office hours whether or not anybody is there. 
but it becomes uh, interesting on major festivals to have perhaps not only a grand Eucharist with a whole lot of extra music, but also to close the day with second vespers, uh, with a lot of with a lot of ceremony and grandeur. And that's what we're doing today. It might seem inappropriate in Lent, but we're not in Lent. I mean, as you know, Lent has 40 days, and if you count the 40 days, the 40 weekdays from Ash Wednesday till Holy Saturday, there are 40 of them, and the Sundays don't count. We can hoop it up on a Sunday, because it is the Lord's day, and it's the day of resurrection. So, we're gonna do that. And Mr. Kennerly is going to help us with that. Um, one of the things we're going to hear is, uh, as Deacon Tim already said, music that you might have heard in and around the, the Church of San Zeno in Verona. Now, you can tell by looking at this that this church is in some ways like San Zeno, more maybe on the, the outside shape than the inside shape and decoration, and in some ways not. But this is the, any 16th century Italian walking into this church would have said, oh yeah, 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 it looks like a church to me and a good one. Um, this church has had a hundred years of having beautiful music echo in it and I hope it will do so for hundreds of years to come. But for today, we're going to pretend, I'm gonna pretend, that I'm in 17th century Northern Italy, that I'm on a trip between Rome and Venice, stopping in major places, including Verona. And we're gonna hear all the different ways that composers in that period found to decorate the basic liturgical materials of Vespers. There's a lot of things you can do. You can take the tune of the psalm tone and decorate it. You'll hear that in the first magnificent Monteverdi piece. You can have the organ play some of the psalms. You can have the choir sing some of the psalms and the organ play. Did you know that the organ can talk? Well, it can. When it plays verses 2 and 4 and 6, you will see. You can, you can take the words and just compose whole new music with no relation to the original chant. You can sing the psalm or the hymn just straight ahead with the Gregorian chant that it has always closed it. There are a lot of different ways of embellishing the liturgy, and we are going to have the pleasure of hearing most of them beautifully performed this afternoon as soon as I stop talking and turn things over to my good friend and admired colleague, Mr. James Kennerly, whom you know I expect. He's the director of music here and the director of music at the choir school, and will be standing right here in a little while but for now, he's gonna come and stand here. James. Well, thank you, Tom. It's, it's great to relive uh, the, that version of how we got to where we are now through the mind of, as, as, as Deacon Tim hinted, one of the great musicologists of this particular music from these particular times. So it's a joy to sit there and kind of let it just roll over. It reminds me of my undergraduate days when I had these extraordinary lecturers. Um, and probably at the time, me and my colleagues thought, oh, well, do we need to go to that lecture? Oh, we should go there. Um, uh, just a wonderful reminder of where we are in Harvard Square. Um, and as Deacon Tim mentioned, and as Tom mentioned, this building really is the reason for the liturgy that we're doing today, not just because we are here in a wonderful quasi quasi monastic community. We have the, the church and the parish offices and the choir school and the Harvard Catholic Center in a sort of a monastic formation just to my right and to your left. Um, but that always reminds me of our monastic tradition. Now, this building is not a monastic building. Clearly, we don't have any choir stalls. If you've been to Mass here, you'll know that the choir tends to sing from the West Gallery. Um, sometimes we'll sing from these makeshift stalls which were put in the place of an altar um, several decades ago. But if we walked into a medieval European, let's say, cathedral or collegiate church, a big building with impressive towers and columns and stained glass, the first thing you would expect to see 
would be some wood, a lot of wood in fact, around this area. And you might even not be able to see it because there would be a screen, a rude screen, R-O-O-D, um, not R-U-D-E as the choristers think, um, which would cut off some of the view of the nave, which is where you're currently sitting, named of course because the shape of the roof often if it was built out of wood more explicitly than the vaulting that we have built out of plaster. But the nave, of course, being as in navy, naval, the idea of a ship um, turned on its side. So you would be sitting in the nave. There would be a rude screen separating some or all of your view to the presbytery, which we also call the chancel. And that's where the prayers happen. That's where the priests, the presbyters, would sit if we were a monastery we would have perhaps delicately carved stalls that the, mon the monks, the nuns, uh, uh, nunnery would sit in. They would have their assigned place. And if you've ever been to any of those buildings or if you've been to a gallery like the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, you can actually see bits of them that were taken out and relocated for museum purposes. And they're wonderful expressions of what those places would have looked like. But it's very important to realize that we are not in a monastic building here, even though it might feel like it. And so the first thing you'll realize is that the choir is not going to sing from the gallery. We're going to pretend that we are in a monastic building. We're going to pretend that we have a choir. Q-U-I-R-E is the old spelling. C-H-O-I-R, of course, is the modern recent spelling. And that comes from the word cœur, meaning at the heart. And the idea is that we will recreate this monastic setting in the heart of the holy area of this church, of course, that being closest to the high altar. So you'll notice that the movable altar has been removed because we don't need an altar for sacrificial purposes for any of the offices, unlike for mass. But very importantly, we need the altar for the candles. And if you're a liturgical geek like me, you'll notice that the candle setup is actually quite different from Mass. We have what we call the office candles, and we light those candles not at Mass, but for the offices. And so we have a very strong visual element that separates our experience from the Mass to our experience during the offices. You've heard an extraordinary history of where the offices came from. The Acts of the Apostles constantly remind us that the uh, disciples were praying at the third hour, at the sixth hour, at the ninth hour. Um, and we know that Jesus took much time with his disciples to sit and take stock of the present and to pray. And it's no surprise that the very earliest prayers of the earliest forms of the Christian church were forms of the morning prayers and the evening prayers. And you've heard how that continuum developed over hundreds of years. And of course, St. Benedict, along with many others, but most famously St. Benedict, form his, formed his rule, which gave a very specific way of praying. And at the center of those prayers is the Book of Psalms. And so today we're singing, I expect Benedict wouldn't approve of this, but we're singing uh, an offering, a, ver a variety, a, a smorgasbord of psalm settings. And I don't want this to come across as an academic exercise, but more as a way of celebrating the multitudinous options that we have to, at our fingertips, essentially, um, as modern lit liturgists, liturgists. And so the first psalm that we sing is perhaps the most spectacular. Um, I'm heavily biased because Claudio Monteverdi is without doubt one of my top five favorite composers and his Vespers composed, published in 1610 as really a way of trying to get the music director position at the great Basilica of St. Mark, San Marco in Venice, um, was, was really a, an extremely groundbreaking for the time and continually uh, groundbreaking exercise in how to write music that brings both the best of the old with the best of the new. We have the old style, the Renaissance polyphony, the Stile Antico, the Prima Pratica, the first style, that Monteverdi, who was an expert, of course, in that, that's how he was trained, but also the new style, the Seconda Pratica, the second practice, which highlighted the idea of melody, of virtuosity, of instruments being used in the ensemble and not just voices. 
And so the Vespers of 1610, as, as Tom Kelly so brilliantly pointed out, uses all of those elements. The plain chart, which stands at the center of the offices, it has forever, and I believe it still will, um, combined with the texts of the Psalms is what gives us this richness of liturgy. So we begin with the DC Dominus, as you've already heard, but we don't begin with that text. The first text, as you heard here, is worship the Lord your God, and we know that from the, um, the idea of the Decalogue, the, uh, the introduction to the Ten Commandments. And so even before we hear the Psalms, we have another piece of text that puts it into context, the Antiphon, proper to the time and very specific to this Sunday of Lent. I'm not going to spoil the details of the Monteverdi for you. You're going to hear those. And I expect if it makes you sort of sit up and sort of jerk yourself to attention, well, it should, because this is life-changing music. Now, of course, we're in 2022. Just imagine what those musicians, parishioners, priests, I dare say, thought in 1610 when they first heard this music. It's extremely novel modern in the extreme, and yet it relies entirely on this strong, rooted sense of connection to psalmody and to plain song, to plain chant. Uh, it's a very dramatic text. We talk, we talk about crushing the heads of the enemy, and the Lord shall reign forever. This is the Old Testament God in the extreme, and the choristers particularly love to sing this piece because they think about squashing their, expect their colleagues' heads um, in the nicest, most gentle Christian way possible. Um, but the music is absolutely undefined in its portrayal of what that should sound in, in musical form. So you will look forward to that. Now, Monteverdi wrote his piece uh, with options for instrumentalists. Now, we don't have any instrumentalists today apart from this wonderful um, box here. We call this a chamber organ or a positive. If you've ever seen um, Saint Cecilia with a little organ sort of under her in the crook of her neck, perhaps, that is essentially the same thing. A positive organ, a positive that would be pumped perhaps by bellows and with a very small compass and therefore not many pipes and therefore not very heavy, um, even though she may have had superhuman strength. Um, now this is the modern day version. It's based on historical models. Um, but you'll see a power chord that betrays its 20th century roots. Um, this is not the Holy Spirit coming in. This is 110 amps, uh, volts, sorry, not amps, hopefully, or it'll explode very quickly, of electricity. But that, that does the job of somebody who could otherwise be pumping the bellows. And if you look to your right, you'll see a beautiful 19th century American-built chamber organ that has just that. There are bellows on the side, and we can power that with human power if we need to. But this organ is going to provide the centerpiece of the musical accompaniments to everything we do in choir. And if we went to any church in the 17th century, and indeed, sadly, now you can do the same, um, except many of the organs that you see in galleries to your right and left, perhaps behind you and in front of you, often in two, three, four or more locations in one church, those organs would have sounded out Sadly, due to the ravages of time, many of them simply don't function now. Um, but you can still see what that looked like and imagine the music and the singers and the instrumentalists that would have played with them. But Monteverdi wrote these instrumental parts and he tells them we can leave them out. Well, we're not going to leave them out because we're creative and we're fun-loving here at St. Paul's. And so our um, organist, Mr. Adak, is going to play those antiphon, uh, those, those ritonelli, as they call them, meaning the returns, from the back organ. So we will have some sense of the spatial use of the building. Monteverdi loved using the effects of the spaced out choirs, the cori spezzati, the idea of, of, of polychoral sound, many different groups of voices coming from different parts of the building. And again, if you've never seen or heard music at St. Mark's in Venice, I invite you to go online and look up someone like the Monteverdi Choir singing the, the Vespers of 1610, and you'll see something of the visual excitement and the spatial excitement that this music is often coupled with. Now, we are going to use a slightly more conventional plain chant setting for the, the second psalm. 
and that we're going to have just the boys sing. And it's very important to realise that plain chant sounds very different if it's sung up here to if it's sung down here. If you walked into a monastery, of course, you would have that pitch of the sound, the singing, would have been much lower. If you walked into a, a cathedral or a building that had boys that sang as part of that monastic tradition, or, of course, into a nunnery, you would have heard it much more up here. And so simple things like the pitch of the plain chant that's so central to these offices would have had a very different cast, a very different colour, based on the, the genders or the ages of the community that was celebrating them. So to show that off, the second psalm will be sung by the boys with a little bit of organ accompaniment. But that's not all. Um, I'm not on a, a TV sales marketing sprawl here, you might think I am. But we're also going to introduce another technique that was very popular at the time, which was called the technique of alternato, of back and forth, of singing one verse and the organ playing another verse. Now we see this in the Mass in the extraordinary form where the priest is praying the words of the canon or of the, the ordinary, the Gloria in Excelsis, the Sanctus, and we might be singing them as a choir or you might be praying silently as a congregant, but what's really important in that setting is that the, the priest is saying those words in silence and secret, as it says in the Missal. Um, and so the organ, likewise, is praying those words for us, but we are thinking them. Um, as singers, we're going to be going through in our head what they would sound like, and that tradition of alternatum lasted well into the 20th century. In fact, today, if you go to a French cathedral, you will often hear not a choir singing the introits of the mass, but a wonderful organ blazing out sound, and that directly connects to that tradition of the organ substituting, as you will, for the voices. And the third, perhaps the most uh, traditional setting of the music will be for the New Testament canticle, when we will have the gentlemen of the choir sing unaccompanied um, for the, ant the, the antiphon and then the texts um, that are given to us to plain chant. So we're going to hear a really lovely spread of how the music has been set over the last few centuries of those core parts of the office of the psalmody and, and the New Testament canticle. It's all based deeply on that plain chant tradition and I think perhaps most extraordinarily today, we're singing in Latin. And I'm not going to go into the depths of what happened during the Second Vatican Council and how the breviary, as you, said, as you heard from, um, from Tom Kelly, the book that contains the liturgies of the hours, the portions of the Psalms that should be said or sung, really, um, at the appropriate times of the day. Of course, the breviary doesn't say how that music should necessarily be sung. That's why, as composers and church musicians, we have a certain amount of license. But at the Second Vatican Council, there was a lot of thought given to the place of the offices. Um, only known was removed. That's the one that happens at about 3 p.m. Um, and so that was um, struck off from the tradition. But all of the others remained and still remain. And, of course, the most popular has become that of morning prayer and then Vespers as evening prayer. But we can just as legitimately call those the, the, the matins and the Vespers service. And I thought it would be fun to finish on a small meditation by a teacher of mine, um, Monsignor now, Andrew Wadsworth, who is the head of the ICEL in Washington, D.C., and this is the group that is charged by 11 conferences of bishops with translating these Latin texts, which of course themselves are translations from the original Hebrew texts, if they're of the Old Testament and especially of the Psalms. Um, and one of the challenges as church musicians, as lay uh, as well as priests, is that we don't have a fixed set of chants and translations in the vernacular for the office. And so we, uh, I say we, my, my colleague Mr. Araka, is an extraordinary resource, and also many people throughout the 
um, the Catholic and the Anglican worlds, have been making their own creations for these musical settings. Often the English doesn't scan in the same way as the Latin. Often the Latin has more syllables or perhaps fewer syllables, so we can't just stick the Latin words underneath, sorry, the English words underneath the Latin and sing it as it goes. Um, a great deal of creation has to go into that. But as I say, Monsignor Andrew Wadsworth has been tackling this task for the last 10, 12 years now since the missile was produced in 2011. Um, and I found this article that he wrote extremely moving because this is somebody who is intimately connected with the texts, with the notion of the daily office. He says this, in the general wider conversation, people talk a lot about mindfulness. Well, the liturgy of the hours is the church's exercise of mindfulness. It's so that no time passes us by, but in all times, we have the opportunity of raising our hearts and minds to God. I suppose we always have the temptation of thinking that these things are great and recent insights, but of course, oftentimes, they're nothing more than the rediscovery of a very ancient insight. And I think that very ancient insight is exactly what the office has to offer for us today as contemporary Catholics, as contemporary Christians. Thank you. That's a very good question. The, the Angelus isn't part of the office. It's part of the recitation of the, the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, the angel of the Lord um, announced unto Mary and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women, blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. You can tell I know this stuff because I've been doing it for a long time. Um, but it wasn't directly connected to the office, although, of course, um, any place that prays the office will, of course, pray the Angelus twice a day. One of the interesting things to me about being a student of medieval music is that I get to go around and look at chant manuscripts, um, some of them very old. And one of the most remarkable things to me is that it is almost impossible to tell when you have a chant manuscript of the office, whether it was intended for a community of men or a community of women. The music looks exactly the same, the same Musical clefts are used, if that means anything to you. And unless there are rubrics or instructions that say the abbess then proceeds to lead the procession, unless there's a word like that, it's almost impossible to tell. The idea is that the office is universal and the singing of it is done by who? There's always somebody in charge to lead the antiphon and lead the psalm, and if I start, then everybody's got to sing it at that pitch. And if I go, they got to sing it at that pitch. That's why you try to pick good singers as the cantor or the cantrix. But the short answer is, there's almost no visible difference. Although, of course, the sound is a completely different world. And I should just mention, the one notable difference is the setting of the tenebrae lessons. Um, that would happen during Holy Week by Francois Couperin and several other composers from the 17th and 18th century France, where they were writing for a very specific nunnery. Um, and of course, these are set for upper voices, and so we do them perhaps with a countertenor, which is a high singing male. Can I sing up here? But of course, they were written for female voices. That's one of the few exceptions that is specifically written for the monastic communities that were female. I think we have time for one more question. And, uh, 
this question came up. How, how would this music from Northern Italy, let's say this is 1650 or something, um, how would it be different in Northern Europe, in England or in some other place in Northern Europe? I think it would be more similar than it would be different. I think the aesthetic of the 17th century, although an awful lot of things come from where the sun shines and radiate to where the sun shines less well, um, uh, there's also, there is the matter of the, of, of the, the uh, Protestant Reformation. And, and so it might be that in some aspects, some parts of Northern Europe, you might have Tudor church music in England, you might have some reformed music in, in Holland, you might, have, uh, you might have some Lutheran chorales elsewhere. So there might be faith-based reasons for the music to sound different. But composers, as composers, were generally, very generally, writing music that sounded like music that other composers were writing. And I should say, having grown up in the Anglican church, just as important when we were choristers um, was that of morning prayer matins. That was followed by the mass. But then in the afternoon we had evensong. Now evensong is a, a, a conjoining of the service of Vespers and Compline. Vespers has the Song of Mary, the Magnificat. Compline finishes with the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. And the reformers during the, the English Reformation took those two and stuck them together. And I would say that one of the richest expressions of the office today remains in the Anglican Church. If you go to King's College, Cambridge, for example, and hear Evensong, it's an extraordinary way that things kind of diverged, but they came right back to where they were in terms of the centrality of the office and the importance within the cycle of prayer. Okay, well, let's thank our presenters. Uh, and we continue with Vespers at 3.30 um, in 10 minutes. Um, again, restrooms are located across the bridge in the campus center. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation.
Yeah.